one man, one community, in the Trailer Music School's monthly group call. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Welcome. Thank you guys for uh, turning up. So welcome to another I guess episode of the Trailer Music Composers podcast, but this this week, this month, is going to be another group call with my Trailer Music community at the Trailer Music School. Uh, so these guys each month are going to get a brief, and they write to that brief, and then I give them feedback on a select few tracks, and also if they've got some sort of burning questions, then uh, they they can ask those questions. Uh, Minko Carlsbeek is uh, obviously the the biggest question producer of the community, uh, usually averaging about ten questions. I think you've been, you know, reined in this this month. Um, so nice to see you all. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, so, shall we start with the questions, Espen? Yeah, uh, let's start with Paul. He asks. Uh... It seems there are two main types of trailers, customs and releasing an album for a production in which a publisher gets you the sync with the trailer house. Is this correct? What are the details we as the composer should know? How does one get custom work? Thanks so much. Okay, there's a couple of questions in there, isn't there, really? Yeah. Um, does it only work as a production music company and a custom scoring? company pretty much sometimes the two worlds meet uh so what you'll find with trailer music is there'll be a bunch of composers who are called on for custom work which is when they write to the brief usually to the trailer uh not often not the actual trailer if they do give you a trailer they'll give you an nda or some kind of like blacked out version of the trailer that just had ed has edit points and things um, and that's the custom work. That's uh, the big prize money at the end of it, basically. But it's also very, very stressful and competitive. Uh, well, it's all competitive. But uh, there, what's so? What's happening? It's 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 all these trailer libraries sort of putting their composers forward to the uh, trailer houses. The trailer houses are all making their cuts for the trailers, and they're getting sometimes, not always, custom. Uh, tracks written for those trailers and then there's multiple trailer houses pitching for the same job so what you'll find is that you know there could be any number of trailers having custom composers working on it so i've worked i've worked on customs with where there's a whole team of us doing custom tracks um for uh a trailer within the one company and then there are multiple companies doing the same stuff custom works it can be really fun i'm not a huge fan of it myself and i say this quite a lot because i, I the thing i love about trading music is the experiment experimental nature of it but also i love the fact that i can kind of do it on my own time custom work being in the uk means that you, when you're doing custom work it's almost like you never sleep <laughs> because you'll work all day here and then at six in the evening la wakes up and sends you feedback so you then work from six in the evening to two, three in the morning, go to sleep, wake up at whatever it is in the morning, six, seven in the morning for the second round of feedback on the track from LA. Uh, so it can be very, very uh, hard work, but it also can be incredibly good. Uh, I've, had, I've had a custom where the editor and the supervisor just contacted me and said, look, we want you to do the job. We love your work. Just do what you do. <laughs> what this is nice uh so yeah that's custom uh how you get into custom is basically hmm, there's many many it's it's how do you get into anything really there's many many doors to the same room uh it could be uh through meeting and connecting with music supervisors, through editors, through trailer house owners, through trailer music library owners, there's many, many ways. Uh uh, the, the way I have got custom is through obviously Vic at Elephant Music and through, I used to do custom work with Pusher as well. Uh, so that's, I went through the music library company who were pitching me and a handful of other composers. 
The other side of it is the production music, which is basically a music library. So you produce albums on spec for a music library's brief to their deadline. And then they send out the album to all their clients. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's where I sit very, very happily because I can write pretty much whatever albums. Oh, hey, Wenda. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, pretty much. I forgot what I was saying now. Uh, I can write pretty much whatever I want at, you know, at a leisurely pace. Customers very much like we need it yesterday, or it can be. Um, whereas working to an album is generally a lot more relaxed. You'll have sort of weeks, perhaps even months to work on an album. Uh, and, you know, it's it's just lovely just to sit in your own studio and just, just make a load of noise, you know, and just feel a little bit more relaxed about it. But I know, you know, Kieran and Cody here on the show as well, they, uh, they love custom and they're very, very good at it too. And John Hansen, who was on the, on the podcast, uh, from confidential music, he is masterful at custom and listen to the podcast episode because he talks about custom in, in like a beautiful scoring way. He is scoring the trailer, um, I think, honestly, I just dealt with imposter syndrome heavily whenever I did custom. You know, I don't deserve this. And then I'd up a limit and produce a really below par track. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, got dark. Next question. Yeah, uh, this is from Minko. Uh, this month was epic synth pitch. This focuses, in my opinion, on hook sounds or signature sounds. When you do an album of this stuff, do you keep everything in the template? Do you build a new template per track or only change the signature stuff? Like, uh, for instance, you keep the strings and all of that in the same temp template. Great question. Well, um, I would say I approach this in a, a lot more relaxed way. Organic sound design and sound design in general for me is kind of like a halfway house between no template and a beautifully laid out template. Uh, the thing you've got to think about if you're approaching sound design, this level of sound design, you're thinking to yourself, okay, what is it that I will need on every track? Okay, so I'm going to need drums. I'm going to need swish hits. I'm going to need pretty much all level of percussion. So have your percussion, percussion stems ready in these types of tracks because they are the things that you will need on everything. Then there will be some go-to things. They're you know, not signature sounds, but like basses, uh, synth pads, and washes. Have some stems of those. And they're, what they're going to be is they're going to be your sketching materials. They're like your pencils when you're doing a painting, essentially. And then so if I was doing the throat stuff, which is the organic sound design with the cello, um, I would have that. I would have my drums. I would have my other sounds so with that stuff i would have a, a selection of stems of strings uh, because it's quite string heavy and then i would just have a load of audio channels where i would just have some fun creating organic sounds uh, and it's just it's it's a re i really love this world because it's like it's it's got the rigidity of large templates and structures but then it's got the freeform play of sound design so my suggestion would be to ease the pressure from yourself is as I as I have done in the epic in the hybrid trailer course, sketch the track with hits. Sketch out your acts, sketch out the drops and how you will do them, sketch out any major rhythmic elements. So obviously in this type of stuff, you get a lot of uh, reiterations of rhythms specifically uh, you'll have like that kind of dun 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 just before a boom, and then that will switch into tuplets or triplets uh, dun, 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 or something like that and there there'll be just ornaments of the same thing basically just highlighting a four bar drop at any point you know or highlighting the boom. and once you've sketched that out you then have relieved the pressure because your mind is telling you, well, I've done the track because I can see it from start to finish. So there's no more panic about finding an original sound. And my advice on this one is if you are going to approach original sounds, i.e. signature sounds, think about them in a much more simplistic way. You can use a stock synth patch for a signature sound, but think about playing it differently. 
you know you can hear a lot of trailer composers to make their sounds air quotes signature they just use pitch bends they bend it as if it's being played it's blown my mind pitch bends i i mean that's how i've done it as well and that's all i'm doing on the cello you think about what people do when they create organic sound design with an instrument there's there's usually some malleability to the sound and the quickest way for that is pitch uh, and if pitch isn't, if you, if you don't want to mess with pitch, then mess with filters. You know, you can get, you know, the, like the mouth, Wah. opening the filter, all of a sudden this single tone has so much more character. If you mix the two filters and pitch, then you can take a relatively dull sounding patch and make it really, really interesting. I think I went on a bit there, but you know, you get the point. Yeah, this one is from uh, Brigida. What's the story behind the intro slash outro music of the TMS podcast? Where can we listen to the whole track? <laughs> uh, I'd love to say this was an interesting story. It's really not an interesting story, Brigida. Um, the story was simply, uh, I was starting the podcast and I thought, well, <laughs> all my favorite podcasts have like a characterful intro, an intro that identifies them separately from another show and i don't mean like stock music um so a couple of one of my favorite ones has it's the it's the host beatboxing at the start i think it's great because you're like oh the host's making some tunes yeah this is awesome so i thought okay what am i well known for i'm well known for badly played cello so i simply uh played my cello badly for that intro and i was like well how am i going to make it sound all cool and then i just did all my usual stuff which is basically just a riser and a big swish hit at the end, uh, cheating. Uh, and then the one man was just a play on the, um, oh, I've forgotten his name, the famous voiceover artist, Don LaFontaine. In a world, you know, that one. Uh, that was just my play, you know, one man. That was that was the story behind it. It's That's a nice question. I like it, creative. Yeah. I, I'm... I'm I'm sorry it wasn't as sexy and as cool as it could have been, but it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is what it is. All right. uh, maybe you can send it to her if she wants to listen to it. Oh, the full track. You've heard the yeah. full track already. That's it. I'm not going <laughs> to waste my time writing a three-minute queue if I'm only going to use 30 seconds. Uh, I wrote a 30-second queue, Bridget. Uh, I can, of course, uh, if anyone wants to hire me to produce a custom based on the intro, I will be happy to take offers. So. <laughs> right. Uh, from Wenda, she wants to know, uh, what did you get to replace your Mac that died? And how do you like it? You're going to be so disappointed in me, Wenda. Uh, so my 2010 Mac is still active. It's still here. It's still the workhorse of my studio. I did, however, fork out quite a lot of money for a replacement. <laughs> there you go. That cardboard box holds the next 10 years of my production. It's one of those uh, Mac Towers. Uh, it's basically, compared to what I'm running, it's basically a, a spaceship from Star Trek. But, you know... Uh, so I'm a little bit intimidated. I know I mentioned this on uh, when I was talking to Kieran and Cody on the, the banter show, as we call it. Uh, I, I'm intimidated by having to transfer on my sample library. Not the actual transferring of the files, but telling Logic where all my presets are. Because even though you can say, Logic, I've saved them all here, and it goes, okay, I'll figure, that, I'll figure them all out. It doesn't. You know, you load up an old session and it's like, please, please, please relocate this for yourself. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I, I know the summer's coming and I could potentially do that then. But Wenda, give me another two years, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll need some more. Actually, I'm not going to say it. Fingers crossed. My, my beautiful Mac is still running smoothly. But the only issue is I can't I can't run some of the libraries I've bought because... I load it and logic dies. Uh, which one was it? The who did uh, Los, An Los Angeles scoring strings? They did an absolutely stunning brass library that I bought, and I was so excited to load it up. And every time I load it up, it crashed. So yeah, it just sits there. 
Audio Bro, that's it, yeah. It's just yeah. sitting there sparkling in my contact menu, like <laughs> the, the mythical beast I will never play. But uh, yeah, that was that's it, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, should we move on to listening to some tracks? Yeah, okay. So uh, just so you can remind the listeners as well as the, the good people in the community, uh, what was the brief this month, Espen? It was uh, dark action sound design, just uh, pretty much the synths and uh, hard-hitting drums. Okay. Before we uh, listen to... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, Paul, I'm running a 2009. Oh, nice. <laughs> you have out-old-schooled me. Well done, sir. Uh, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about this action sound design stuff. Uh, yeah, like we've got stereo running. Uh, ju just for the listeners who haven't been on these calls before, uh, I have historically done everything in mono just because I couldn't find the button that says stereo on Zoom. But now Espen's taken over. It works brilliantly. Anyway, uh, let's talk about action sound design. This is somewhat a staple for trailing music composers. Uh, and I think it's a really important staple for the simple fact that you're learning not just to write action sound design cues. If you treat these as stems for other styles of writing, then you are actually just reinforcing what you have already learned about trailer music. So much of action sound design is rhythmic interest, but at its simplest. You know, uh, we're not, I'm not talking TV spot action sound design, which is bonkers and amazing, and I love it. We're talking big feature trailers, big sounds, big drums. But then you just replace the sound design element and put hybrid synth and orchestra. The drum, the drum stems are still pretty much going to do the same stuff. So it's a really, it's a really interesting one because it hammers home some basic principles about structure about build and about tension. Can you maintain build structure and tension with minimal elements? It's very, very tempting with sound design to just layer a ton of stuff. But as with, you know, like a lot of EDM, you can just have one synth being the workhorse or one single sound. I, you know, I'm not saying I do that. I, I, I have a tendency of over layering. And I think that's an insecurity thing personally, but uh, you know, Making up for something, obviously. Uh, so this one is a workhorse because it gets placed on so many trailers. And like I said, it does get used across the board, not just action films. It's often used action, horror, thriller, sci-fi, you know, basically everything except family films. Uh, they will use these, even in comedies, they'll use these because they're just fantastic. And again, it's all over TV. Uh, TV promos and things, and TV spots, because action sound design cues are punchy, and they are loud, and they have character straight away. And if you can communicate that with your track, then you're more likely to land a TV spot. TV spots need to be loud, they need to be in your face, and they need to be, uh, yeah, basically an oral slap in the face, really. So let's uh, start with, uh, I think it's here, uh, Tim Brown. This uh, track, Ascent into Darkness. Nice name.
dude tim what are you having for breakfast <laughs> uh wow okay so let's talk about the thing that grabbed me immediately tim has done the thing that a lot of composers worry they can't do and tim has created very simple but fantastic signature sounds and it was l filled with them it felt almost like you know act one was split into two act two was split into two and act three was split into two as well it felt like each individual section had its own signature sound so i would suggest to you tim take each of those signature sounds and make a new track this is almost like a six track thing or at least a three track thing. The thing I really liked is how it starts off very, very simply. It starts off with a signature sound ticking. So Vic and I, where we were on Project Day, we're often talking about simplicity, especially with this stuff. You wanna start small because especially if you wanna get a big sound, the way to achieve a big sound is to have a comparably quiet sound. So if you start smaller, the bigger climax will seem bigger in comparison. And this is why we put those stop downs in our cues in between, especially act two and three, because it makes the return of act three seem even louder in comparison to the silence. So I really liked how you started that nice and simply, nice and I wouldn't say quietly, but it was simple. What I would suggest is that Act 1 could be, the tension could be built more gradually. It felt like there was sort of one section and two section. The first section with a, with a long, slow, was it a long, slow? Was long, slow the second one? The first section had one signature sound. The second one had, I think, a longer a signature sound, but the ticking sped up. I would have liked to have it feel like a more gradual increase in tension and then layer some risers. Don't worry and do not avoid using risers in Act 1 because remember, Act 1s are used in Act 1s of trailers and especially this type of stuff. This is for me on the horror side of action sound design, especially, you know, towards the end with that screaming. Uh, so in horror trailers, they will have a big riser into the drop where we're suddenly dropped into this terrifying world because that transition in a horror trailer is oh isn't oh isn't this nice holiday cottage isn't this really this is a lovely holiday cottage let's all go wait wait what's in this dark room and then this is where the tension comes in and then they open the door and boom you know we get the drop into the flying tea cakes and you know all sorts of terrible things you know knives and forks not being separated correctly in the dishwasher. Then let's go into act two. For me, I think it's, it had the same thing. I wanted to hear you ramp up the tension more, Tim. It was, it was again, the sounds were fantastic. The hits were great. You left a lot of space, which I liked. In fact, Espen, uh, could we hear act two again? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Again, Act 2 can start small. OK, stop. Okay, so here, that's what I'm, it felt like we had, we jumped into a separate section. It was almost like another track, or at least the third act, or at least another act of another track. You know, I wanted more of that monster cello thing. You're going, you know, that's... That could grow and become a single trailer cue. And this is what we have done so well with the Throat series, is it would often just be one signature sound that just kind of grows throughout. Because you've got to remember, think of it from an editor's point of view. They want to give the trailer a sense of identity. And if your cue has loads of signature sounds in it, it doesn't immediately have that identity. So I would suggest either taking that first sort of yowling cello and making that, that and growing that act too, or starting cutting out and starting from the bit when the ticking comes in. Um, 
and then build up the tension. And it's such a simple way, guys. Just layering risers is a huge, huge way to bring tension. It's not cheating. <laughs> it's not cheating. It's kind of like somebody saying, oh, you can't play a violin with a long bow. That's cheating. You know, it, you've got to create a sustained sound and it can't all be low wobbling basses. You need to have sort of these glistening textures rising up from the earth. Then when we hit into Act 3, loved it, felt massive. Uh, not too sure about the vocal. I liked it, but it kind of, I felt pigeonholed the track a bit too much. You know, they're kind of like screaming man. It could be, that would be an alt version, you know, with scream or whatever. But uh, this, Tim, for me, is the start of an album rather than a single cue. And, and I think that's a very positive message to go go forward with amazing signature sounds just remember to build that tension you start it simply keep building that tension yeah i like talking about this stuff <laughs> uh, should we move on no no let's carry on talking about it uh anyway, no yeah we'll go we'll move on. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go with minko with his uh track when i'm gone avenge me has he put an 808 kick on this one yes <laughs> Or <laughs> no. Dude, that was intense. Uh, I'm going to start at the end, uh, not the very end, but that when we dropped into Act Three, I was like, "Oh, it's lost intensity." And then you were, I like, oh, loved it. Now I'm going to do that really annoying thing. Can we have another ten more seconds of rise? Maybe even fifteen. It's one of those things where you cannot have enough of that. It's, it's like no one's going to say to you when you're doing an epic hybrid track, whoa, your act three sounds way too big. You know, it's in this stuff, no one's going to say, oh, you know, that riser was well too tense. You know, it's I because of the way you've done it, and it's a really clever trick to avoid thinking of act three in a certain way, really clever trick to almost take act two and just extend it you know we had that act two was built brilliantly by the way the tension the right i loved all the risers that's that's how you build it, it also it was simple it was just like, like dun, 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 dun. 
I don't go all the way through. And then these risers, the, the lovely sort of gated synth that was that you opened it. Oh, this is a really good trick, opening up the filter. And when I say filter, it always sounds snazzy, but you can just use a high pass or low pass EQ. That's that's all I'm ever talking about. I'm not talking about anything snazzier than just closing down or opening up those uh, single band EQs. Fantastic act two. Um, I would possibly, instead of having the kind of lull into act three, I would possibly have either a complete drop cut where it's like, whoop, boop, and then it comes into it like, you know, again, like someone's slapping you in the face really hard. They, you think they've gone, but they've actually just got a massive glove. And, you know, I, I, yeah, because I think that would be more impactful than the lull. Lulls you have to really, really know how to do. They're, they are surprisingly tricky. It's kind of like middle eights. People put, will slap a middle eight on here and there and, and, I need to realize they've just slapped like eight bars of inferior songwriting onto a great song. If you're going to do a lull, understand that the drop has to come in, but the tension needs to be there the entire time, even in a lull. But yeah, I think a drop cut straight into the thing, another 15 seconds of riser. The only, the only query I have is on that initial string bend. Sometimes when you bet when you pitch bend too much, it sounds very keyboardy. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. It's up to you to decide. Uh, I would suggest either reducing the amount of notes that are being played in the patch. It sounded like there was quite a few notes in there. Maybe maybe it was like a, an octave and a fifth. Uh, oh, he's writing. Um, a couple of pa okay, there we go. That might be why um, the pitch felt like you know when you you know when you've got like open up a, a synth patch that you don't realize it, but the pitch bend is set to two octaves, and you start playing with it, and you're like do 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 do, you know, wait what? It it felt a little bit like that, and I would just probably address that either by just completely smashing it to death with all kinds of distortion, saturation, compression, to the point where it sounds like a distant monster being abused in, on another planet, you know, that type of thing, you know, like. And then you can bring it forward a little bit more. Once it's in the, once you've got the drums in and everything else, it, it sat much better. It was just when it's stark on, on its own, you have to be really kind of wary of the sound choices. But that was that was great. I loved the last act. Give me more of that last act. Good job. Uh, do you want to maybe answer Paul's question from the chat? Oh, okay. How question. do you add to the track where it sounds like the same sound is just getting bigger and bigger? Minko, do you want to answer that? You took, you I guess you're talking about Minko's track, Rises Upon Rises. Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, I'll let Minko answer. <laughs> I just did the filter thing, and I um, also did the decapitator from Sound Toys. Uh, also used the drive of, of that. I, I, automated, I automated a lot, and I also did some volume rights with the... Uh, with stuff, so there's a lot of uh, layering going on, also with with the signature uh, sound thing, and I I just build up on it on on it, and everything is automated. So there's a lot of automation going on, and um, I have a favorite riser back that Richard did. Uh, um, Twelve string risers is it, but I don't know exactly the name of the of of. Uh, the 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 company uh, Richard invented for that, but uh, you should get that. It's on the TMS uh, um, website, I think. Right? Is it? It, is, it is indeed. Uh, it's yeah. it's just called imaginatively string risers. Yeah, um, it, and I I use that a lot for a lot of different things. It's under it uh, under a, a lot of tracks, and I I heard from Guy Jones, who also uh, for Blue Pearl and and Protege, he he. When there's something missing, he recommends that one. <laughs> so, so that's it. 
well well thank you and thanks for the plug as well that was uh yes yeah I, like... 10% no but the the, <laughs> the main thing is if you if you do the automation thing and also do i also did the the wider uh thing the stereo thing i also automated so maybe that is the thing uh that you talk about getting bigger and bigger it's also getting wider does that answer your question certainly answers my question <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> he said he says okay cool thanks for that thanks miko okay. um yeah great advice uh layering rises or risers however you want to call it layering them at different start points is such an easy win because they're starting at different points it feels like you're creating the most enormous orchestra of noise and if you combine that with automation so much of this stuff organic sound design action to sound design you know even electronic sound design so much of it is just boring drawing in or playing in uh automation of volume of panning of filters but that's the stuff that is going to make one single sound grow throughout the whole queue yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> yes very good uh <laughs> let's do uh richard uh graham this track, uh, Casale. Okay, right. The percussion on that track is fantastic. Is that all castle-related percussion? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to say something kind of outrageous. Uh, I think the percussion could have almost carried that in and of itself. The sounds were so interesting and unique that we, we you definitely didn't need the strings. Strip the strings out. Because the, the danger with putting strings like that on a cue like this is you shift the mood into something completely different. You know, if you do use strings, think of them more as a textural thing or think of them as just playing the root and supporting the boams or the pulses. Um, so I would suggest, as an exercise, take the strings out, especially that time when the strings come in, the percussion sounds brilliant. It's almost like trailerized stomp. Um, and I don't, it's actually quite a common thing for trailers to have odd sections of percussion like that. So it might be one of those wild card tracks that lands because the character of the percussion. Um, you raise an interesting area where you do the, um, the tempo shifts. So a couple of people have asked me, what's the deal with tempo? You know, can you do it? Uh, you can use tempo changes. Tempo slows and speed ups within an, a section. I don't know. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to have an editor here to support my point of view, but my thoughts on is that it 
reduces its usability as as a piece if you had it as almost a toolkit of tempo slows you know a slowdowns you know woo, 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 then it could be really usable especially those sounds you had i would like to hear the percussion being used a lot more sparsely at the, in the intro so you've you've done something that i often fall prey to especially in horror stuff you know there's this tendency with horror especially the sound design end to have uh, ricochets and all sorts of interesting effects from string players you know and what we tend to do is we we worry that we're leaving too much space so we chuck in loads of them every bar there's a new kind of string effect and in this case every sort of bar there was a new kind of percussion like leave us with a bang your castle, Rich, for those of you listening, Richard apparently lives in a castle, which I think we can see behind him. Uh, King Richard. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, the, the 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 sound of those sounds just lovely. So keep take the strings out. There's some nice brass in there. Now I think what we can do is take what Minko has done in his and apply the same to your brass. So if you're going to use boams. Think of them as starting quiet or starting distant and then getting closer. So when they, when you start them, you can start them all playing up to their top registers, or at least with the, with the horns, their mid to high register. But the problem is you have nowhere to go from there. So you either start low with just the tubers, uh, euphoniums, etc., or you do have the same patch playing exactly the same notes across the track and you use a single band um, high cut filter that you open up. So it starts off as if they're in the distance, you know, and you just open it up gradually. It's such a cheap trick, but it works wonders, especially if going from one section to the next, you open the filter considerably. Uh, so yeah, take the strings out, progress that Brahm in, I would probably suggest to take the tempo thing out and think of progressing the intro in a more sparse but uniform way. Because you think about, imagine those hits being edit points. That type of thing. Don't be afraid of space, especially in act one. It's, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do is leave space. It's like negative space in a drawing. Sometimes the negative space can be the most powerful aspect of it. Uh, but great track. Love that percussion. Let's hear more of that. All right, let's move on to Dave Graham, the other Graham. Unleash the beast. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Nice. Right, Dave, for me, this was two tracks. We started off in the kind of the, the epic hybrid world. And then we went into a dark swagger world, you know, that kind of like pentatonic rising. So I would think of this as two separate cues. So I'm going to deal with them with as two separate approaches. In the brief, the action sound design we're going for, we tend to avoid harmonic progressions. Sometimes they're, they are used in the back end when it gets massive. Uh, but generally in the intros, we are letting the signature sound do the work. And I've really felt that that kind of the signature sound you had at the start of this wasn't being given the space it could have had to shine. I loved everything you did in the first half. That's a different brief. Let's take that first sound. The, the simple way to get about this, Dave, is just to take out the harmonic progression. So you had like a question and answer harmony going, you know, you have this do, which I loved. Maybe start the signature sound lower where it's like, and then it just gets filthier and filthier. And then that progression stays on the root chord. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't need to do anything else. Uh, that took me many years to get over this. I, I, I would feel this need to put a progression in there. I'd be in C minor. I'd be like, must put A flat in. You know, it's once you get over that, it's amazing how freeing it is. And I think it would be a really good exercise to just say to yourself, I'm not allowed to use any progressions. So that's the first one. Let's hear that sim that signature sound progress in and of itself. Just as an exercise, you could just do a one minute 30 cue that's, that's just question and answer, but growing. Because you've got great sounds in there, Dave. Now, the second section, Espen, can we hear the second section when it cuts into the... This bit. This is on brief. That sound. Right. right, thanks, Espen. Now, if you're going to do that, that progression, let it jump up that minor third, but don't let it jump up to the fourth. So you've got this bring it back down to the root it's you know because jumping up to the fourth immediately says to us guitarists blue swagger you know we're, we're going in for a gunfight in a bar but before that so for this is for me this david that is the goal that's the money that section that's the bit where you see a superhero uh, you know suddenly coming into their own in act two you know they've got character they've got i don't want to say balls because they might not but you know they've got um aggression they've got confidence it's uh i really really love that and i would love to hear that being pushed and developed and think of it like this that you are not allowed to go anything other than that interval of a minor third you have to explore the growing textures and the growing volumes you know and it, it it's a really tricky one to get your head around but once you do it's just like wow this is this is pretty cool. I can just stay on C the whole time. You know, eat that music education. <laughs> but yeah, great. That's that middle section. Loved that. All right. Uh, we're going to do Mike. So this will probably be the last one. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Brutal Assault.
Wow. If I had my, uh, if I had a subwoofer, I'm sure I'd have ruptured my bowels listening to that. Um, Mike, those sounds were purest filth and I loved them. So this is actually a great example. In fact, an exceptional example of exploring textures and just letting the sounds move and breathe. You know, it, it's, it's almost like you have to imagine that you're twiddling on those synths when you're doing this. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Mike loves to do that. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, you took me somewhere special in that last bit there, Mike. It was absolutely disgusting in a good way. Um, now, let's jump to the start. There is a danger with a ticking sound for it to lag a little. So my suggestion, Mike, is for you to introduce that tick in a more, uh, in a slower way, uh, rather than it kind of coming in right from the start, tick, tick, tick tick because then it then it's then it felt like it sat back on the beat it's kind of like you know how sometimes if you put a four to the floor kick on a track sometimes it excites the track sometimes it makes everything just sit back and relax and but it's the same is, is true of with a pulse like that a ticking pulse um if if you were to approach it like this that you didn't have the tick for the first i don't know 30 seconds and the tick only came in the that section imagine the act two as it were and you brought it in with a tick tick you know uh whole notes half notes quarter notes eighth notes sixteenth notes it's like you're doing like a clubby snare fill but really slowed down and then I, I would probably just suggest we have a, 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 a little bit of a riser. I know, I know it's cheap, but I love them because uh, that would have completely finished off. So just careful we don't sit back on a ticking sound. But once this track got into its, into its groove, Mike, that was, I think, an excellent track to finish on. Excellent track. And, and also the thing is that that sound, hardly anyone does that. Hardly anyone does that like industrial sound design. And there are a couple of companies that do, and they do well with it. And it, it's so unique sounding that it gets used in really interesting trailers. So uh, yeah, keep pushing the envelope with that because that's fantastic. And that's the, the wonderful thing about this brief is we don't sort of rely so much on melodies and harmonies. We rely with our inventiveness with sound. And it still amazes me how you know I've, I've known mike for a while now uh, how i can hear a track and i'm like oh it's mike just because of the way he does those sounds and you know uh, and and i have that with a lot of you i can recognize your cues from the sounds you create and that's what i love about this so guys these tracks were fantastic you know uh good selection espen sorry if you didn't get yours played today um but there will be another brief set for next month, August. I believe I set the date. Have I, have I set the date already? Uh, I'm looking at Espen. He's looking at me. You sent it to me. I'm going to post. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, I have set the date. Um, and do you remember what the next month's brief is? <sighs> oh, that's Espen. Where's the preparation? I'm sorry, okay. guys. I will post it tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, let's we'll post it on the community. Uh, for those of you listening, uh, I hope you enjoyed the creativity and talent of the Trailer Music School. Guys, I'm so, so impressed. That was outstanding. Uh, and I cannot wait to see you all next month. Uh, don't forget, post your questions. I think it's hybrid orchestral. Is it? Ooh. Yeah, so the last month's brief, we had like orchestral. And now it's with the hybrid elements. So yes. superhero, big, yeah, stuff. Yes. It's the combination of the two. Yeah. Um, so actually, Richard's track kind of went there, and so did Dave's kind of went there. It's, it's, the, it's your sound design meeting your orchestral cue in somewhere in the middle and, you know, making sweet sound love. The wonderful thing about this is 
the same rules apply for both of them. Character is so important. And if you can get an interesting sound on a hybrid cue, that sells the cue. I mean, a couple of you from Protégé and nodding, nodding along to that because it's, it's the hymn sheet I sing from every week. Give us character. Give us character. You can do it, even with a piano. Um, so yeah, I look forward to hearing what you guys have done in the next month. And like I said, any questions, fire them over to Esperant in the community so that I can answer those at the beginning of the next month's call. You guys are absolute legends. Thank you for being here. And thank you, everyone who's listening as well. This will be going out as a podcast. If you don't want your music put out, just let us know and Esperant will chop it. But I, I don't know why you wouldn't. It's great publicity. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Right, guys, thank you so much and have a good evening, morning, day, night, wherever you are in the world. And I will see you next week. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.